Hello, good morning, and welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied hands, Quindy, and fly on the wall, John, and then there's Justin. But we won't talk about Justin. He doesn't officially exist yet. Will he might be unexisting for a long time at this rate? Hi, Quindy. Hi, Quindy. I'm assuming that that John it really is kind of a fly on the wall right now. Like that's kind of what he is. He's our little spy cam, just just to make sure we behave. Who we'll report back to Ed? How are you guys doing today? Alrighty. I can see it's a quiet day for chat. Oh, it's okay. Quiet day for ants too. I have to take my car to the mechanic today. I'm getting it towed. <laughs> We're not sure which building wall he might, might be on though, right? Yeah. Yeah, I feel that way, Big Apple. It really is a, it really is a day and a week, right? Hey, Thunder. It is going, it is going well. I mean anticipating pricey car repair and tow not not great but it's going okay it could be worse always could be worse hey bando and uh inara you only just woke up i wish <laughs> we have a wizard 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 he really needs more highlights guys he really needs more highlights and then and then i might want to brighten up his orange a bit yeah yeah i want some orange today some orange and some purple I should probably talk about highlighting purple because there's lots of ways to do it. I talked about it on my Patreon, but it's always good to cover it more than one place. My Patreon is patreon.com slash painting big. I think we're going to use imperial purple and wild violet. So for people who might be looking for a good uh, mid color when you're dealing with the imperial purple triad, you've got nightshade purple on one side, which is almost black. And then you've got amethyst purple on the other side, which is very much lavender. So if you're looking for a color between imperial and uh, amethyst, wild violet actually is not a bad call. So if you were looking to make a lighter purple triad or to create a triad with wild violet as the midtone, wild violet with imperial purple as your shadow. And then I don't think I've got, I had amethyst on my plate. Oh yeah, I do. Okay. There's amethyst. You can see they actually make a great triad. This is intentional. So, oh, I'm sorry that your month of June sucked. Yeah, the shadow right there is essentially painted on. We blended it. We did a really quick wet blend on it, Thunder. So it's kind of rough. It'll get a little bit better. Um, yeah, as you can see, it kind of goes outside the lines here. So I do want to kind of trim it back. It's also a real messy blend. But yeah, when you're trying to blend from dark to light, I just, I often will just do a wet blend. So I had a little bit of walnut that I laid down, which is a dark brown. Uh, and then I had my, uh, my gnawed bone, which is this parchment color. And I just kind of blended them with one stroke. So yeah, I mean, I do want a shadow back here because you can see that there's also, it, it's painted in right here because you can see the cloth overhangs this pretty significantly. So Having something there and not just painting the parchment color up to the sleeve makes it look a little bit better, I think. Thanks. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, it's a really natural. Actually, I just did a PDF on this. Man, I'm already into the Patreon. Ha! Huh? I, I just did a PDF on this um, for the Patreon for the $5 tier. I was talking about mixing highlights and shadows. And one of the ways I mix shadows is to use walnut brown pretty much for every color. Um, walnut is a really, as you can see, a really black brown. Uh, but it has the advantage of making kind of a good neutral shadow color when you mix it with almost anything. The thing you have to worry about is that it's really strong. So when you are mixing shadows with it, you use just a tiny touch of walnut, kind of work your way up until you think you've got a color that is uh, like a good shadow. And then, then you're good. But don't go whole hog with this sucker because it will take over paint. For sure. I need to put this back on Centaur. I have my to-do list on the Centaur we were working on yesterday and totally forgot to stick it back on him. There we go. All righty. So maybe we'll use this triad today. Yeah, there are other ways to mix shadows and I cover them in that PDF. But yeah, that's in general. In general, I find that works. And you could use another black brown if you don't have walnut, as always. Um... You know, if you're using a paint line other than Reaper, you can approximate what I'm talking about. So let's back out and um, let's actually talk about other ways to mix like purple. 
purple highlights. So I did start with Imperial on this sucker. Um, if I wanted to mix a highlight, there are a few different ways to mix purple highlights, but most of them have to do with adding magenta first. So you can use a clear magenta or a single pigment. Ooh, we are not in focus. A clear magenta, which is a single pigment color. Um, also, any other magenta from any other acrylic uh, hobby paint line is going to be made with the same pigment, uh, Queen of Credo magenta. Um, starting with a drop of this and then adding a lighter color will help. If you want to just go straight there, you could use Runic Glow, which is really a mix of magenta with, I think, a tiny touch of blue um, and, uh, and some white. So you could just pop right in there with that if you wanted to do it that way. Um, this is a pretty saturated color. I mean, it's pretty, pretty vibrant. Um, it's not real muted except for the white. So if you did want a more soft purple, then you can do the trick where we use skin tones. Okay, I've got, I've got pale flesh. I've got my other flesh color in the other room, I think. But you can use a pinky or orangey skin color to build a highlight for purple as well. And that's going to make it more softer. If you're looking for a more, if you're working with a brownish purple, like a bruisey purple or orchid, then that can work really well because it does introduce that little bit of yellow that's in the skin tone. Uh, it tends to not be as bright a purple at that point. So if you're looking for more a faded purple, an antique purple, a purple to use on lich robes, you know, that have been sitting in a dusty dungeon for forever, then think about doing it that way. Or you can do it the Master Series paint way and make a triad, uh, which I think is a little more boring but you can also spice this up a bit so i'm gonna i'm gonna work with wild violet because we haven't worked with it ever because it's a kickstarter color that didn't come out um, until recently and uh, i really like this color and i'm hoping that a lot of you will pick it up so let us work with it today uh, that said i'm gonna mix some colors into my amethyst probably or use this as a highlighter color mixed in also with some other things depending on what i what i feel like maybe runic low because I do, I do really like my Runic Glow as a, uh, and you can see how these things might work together, right? If you mix them together, you'd get a, a warmer pink or purple, which actually would work really well off of your Wild Violet. It is a beautiful purple. Yes, I am good at purples. If nothing else, if nothing else, when I was head of the paint department making Master Series paint, I was good at purples. <laughs> Uh, we did not have nearly enough purples in the initial um, pro paint line. I told I told uh, Al that he claimed that they didn't sell that great, and maybe that was because all the initial purples kind of weren't great. <laughs> maybe I'm biased, just a little, just a little bias there, just a tiny bit. All right, let's mix some purples, and then I decided, by the way, to re even though I feel like my orange needs a lot more highlighting, I want to see what my purple comes up to first. So. Right now the purple is darker than the orange and I do want to keep it there. I want to keep it darker than the orange. So even as I mix these um, highlights, I need to keep an eye on that and I may end up throwing a glaze back over this purple to darken it back down. Um, I want contrast. Right now I do have the dark browns. We're probably going to go dark brown with the leather as well. We've got the dark brown skin and the black hair, which is a nice contrast. And we've got the pale scroll. So we do have a dark kind of medium light, medium dark, and light kind of uh, thing going on here. I'll probably also make the shoes dark. We also went black with the inside of the cape and this little piece of cloth here. So we are alternating dark and light, which is one of the best ways to make your character's details really show up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, even with all the purples we make and all the purples everybody else makes in Aura, sometimes you still need to mix your own purple. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you want, ideally, if you're going to have two, you want a warm one and a cool one. You know, a bluish one and a, and a reddish one. I use reddish purples for an awful lot. So I'm going to set up these colors and kind of show you where I'm at. So there's the difference between the Imperial and the Wild Violet. Now, we can check to see if these are going to be um, too, like, far enough apart, I guess, or, or too close, um, by using our grayscale on our color wheel. We can hold the edge over the color and we can kind of figure out what it is. So you can see that that value four is actually coming off as, eh, it's really close. Yeah, I think we're more like that. Value three, when you see, when you can see the edge, 
up against the color, you know that it's actually uh, not quite right. And then when you put that over it, you shouldn't see the edge. You're good. So I'd say that's a value three or four, like maybe maybe on the high side or yeah, high side of three, light side of three. So then let's look at our wild violet. Ideally, wild violet would come in at a five. If it's at a six, we've got a little bit too much difference. Nope, nope, we're good actually, I think. Usually I want my highlight and midtone to be two steps away from each other. There's a little reflection. There we, there we go. So that's still, yeah. So it's actually a four. So these are not as far away as you think. They're one complete step on the color wheel. I feel like maybe actually in person, yeah, this is a value three. Maybe you could argue even a value two. So I'd actually say the camera is making this look a little bit wonky. Yeah, you could argue, there we go. <laughs> the reflection was throwing me off. So it's between... I'd say it's around a two, two to three. And I'd say this one is definitely at a four. So yeah, so two and a half to four, that's one and a half steps, roughly maybe two steps. And that is really, really a good, um, like that's what you want when you're layering or trying to blend two colors. You want that significant step up for your highlight. If it's closer, then you're not gonna see a lot of difference, especially if you're thinning paint. Um, if it's farther apart, it's going to be too hard to blend the two colors. So you ideally want about one and a half to two steps when you're looking at your grayscale and you're looking at your colors that you're intending to blend. Oh, nose. Mild symptoms, just bored because you're stuck in the house. Right, Kodiak, I got it. I hope you recover quickly. May you test to negative in no time. Alrighty, so now I'm gonna just put, since I already have a pretty solid base coat, I'm just gonna maybe mix, I'm gonna mix a two to one with this. I'm gonna start, I think I'm gonna go one to one and see what it's like. One to one is usually my standard start for, uh, for layering. Um, some dark colors you could get away with maybe a little thicker or if the color is really close to each other, you could get away with a little thicker, but usually, um, if you want it to blend nicely, you, you want to thin it quite a bit. So I am going to mix this one up. My purple base coat is a little bit see-through on some levels. So uh, this is a two to one and it's still not bad. I mean, it's see-through, but it's it's got decent body and I'll be able to use this to put a nice smooth base over the top of this just to make it a little more solid. Um, next color. Yes, get lots of rest. Sleep and good foods. It's my cure for pretty much any illness that gets me. Alrighty. Hello, Aesthetic. We are, we are okay. <laughs> You're COVID too. We've got a couple of COVIDers in the chat. People who are suffering and stuck at home. But otherwise, um, yeah, it's kind of a day. This is kind of a week uh, static, but you know, it'll, it'll, it'll pass. All this will pass. Like in some ways, this is a really good week for me. And in others, it's just like awful because I'm getting my car towed today and I don't know how much the repair is going to cost, which is always stressful, right? And it's an old car. So you're like, you're double, double kind of anticipating, right? You're like, is this the big one? Is this the one that makes me think that the car is no longer worth it? You know, it's the, it's that. It's David and I have been having a lot of discussions about what 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 the next car might be, and if we need to, um, because really, since I work from home, and since he bikes to work most days, at least during the summer, he does. Um, I don't know that we need the second car, but in the winter, maybe we do. Hey, Miss Dim, thank you. Thirty one months, nice. Yes, Reaper Live is tonight and tomorrow. <laughs> that sounds painful, War Shadow. Yes, tomorrow is Friday. This is true. This is true. 
I just want to get the tow over with. Like, I just want to, you know, I want the car to just be at the mechanic. Then I can kind of like, even though the money is going to be still a stress factor, it's still, let's just get the dang car where it needs to be. And then I'll just deal. Yeah, kidney stone. Yep. Lots of water. Yeah, it's easy. I have to remind myself to drink more water all the time. I kind of have, at Reaper, I was in this great, uh, great zone where I just had a plan where I drank a certain number of like yetis of water, like throughout the day, I kind of had just like triggers like, Oh, it's after lunch. I get my next, you know, full Yeti full of water or my bottle of water. Um, but you know, since I'm much more free form these days, it's, it's harder to get into that habit. Yeah. Big apple. Yep. Yeah. I'm with you there. The element, we got the element when we got Kiri and Kiri of course passed away um, a year and a half ago. So it's a 2008 Honda element and uh, yeah, we're, it's, it's getting up there. It's not college age yet, but now to, in its defense, it has given me almost zero problems throughout the year. And I've been very good about making sure that it has its service appointments and you know, everything, but you got a question, you know, it is getting long in the fang. So how long is it going to be around? Yeah, Grey Wolf. I have I uh, I have to watch it a lot because of my my medical stuff. So I I'm never like terrible, but dialing in the amount and reminding myself to drink are real real concerns. All right, so we put a little bit of a highlight. You can see it there. Yeah, you can see it when I move the thing away, away from the light. Man, we're getting a lot of like reflections today. But you can see the highlight right there that I put on, and we're going to go down and also apply a highlight to the foot of the cloak right here. This is pretty smooth, actually. Uh, the real test will be down here. The problem with layering is you've got to be able to see the difference, but you've also got to be able to blend it smoothly. I always go against the grain, i.e. if you've got a long shape, go across it. Let's get a little closer here. Yeah, I got you, Twisted Oma. That's all right. All of us have life intervened from time to time. All right. So that is looking okay. I can see, I can't really see my brush strokes. This is actually perfect. So when you're layering with wild violet, I'd say a one to one ratio is just about perfect. When you start your layering stroke, always start pointed toward the shadow, pull back toward wherever you want your highlight to be. The brush stroke is key. Having a brush with a good tip will also help because the finer the tip, the finer the start of your line. And the finer the start of your line, the more you're gonna get that blended effect. Yeah, I'm trying a new mechanic. Like the Honda dealer like failed to call me back for like the third time. And I was just like, you know, I'm just going to go to a local mechanic. I, I had a local mechanic I loved when I was in Texas. And so I am hoping I'll have a good experience with this one. So I don't have a new pup date today, but I can still share pictures from yesterday. I think I have one picture I didn't show you. It's time for the puppies to um, experience the outdoors or start experiencing the outdoors. So Bridget took a puppy for a little walk. The grass was really wet and she didn't want the puppy to get sopping wet and cold. So she, uh, she carried the puppy around the yard for the first one, puppies rather. And she also introduced them to her other dogs. So difference. There's the kind of flat. Now we've got that coming up. Now you can see how that highlight lightens the purple. So we do need to keep an eye on that. Um, I call this surface control and essentially the more of the base color you cover over, the, the more it, the color of your surface, surface is gonna shift. And I know this, so I am going a little heavy with my highlights here, but I can always go back and either glaze or put a wash over it. 
um, to define my shadows a little bit better. And I wanted you guys to be able to actually see the fade, so that's why I went a little heavier with it on this one. Hello, Hobbies Vash. We are doing some layering. I need to rebase cut a little bit. My purple was a little transparent on my first coat. So I just want to make sure I have a nice solid layer down so that I can do highlights like I was doing over here. So I can take my, uh, my base color and just bring it back in kind of in reverse layering and I'll talk about that too in a second. You can layer either way. You can layer up highlights, which is the more you know, common way to do it, or you can layer down shadows. And so you can do both. And while I'm at it, while I'm waiting for that to dry so we can layer it, I'm going to also put a nicer, heavier coat up here on this purple. Hey guys, only four weeks, four weeks exactly till I leave to uh, get my puppy. My new puppy, our new puppy. I have to remind myself, this is David's puppy too. <laughs> I was looking at exercise pens today just to contain the puppy in the room here with me during streams. And uh, I'm just debating on height. Like, as a big dog, you know, maybe you want a 36 inch, um, X pen, but just going to get a little bit more color over here because we're going to come back, back here and uh, highlight these two. Um, but I don't know. I mean, most of my dogs, all the dogs that I had from an early age were trained to respect barriers, even if they were lower barriers. So I will not actually hobbies because, because I'm getting the puppy, like I'll be flying to North Dakota, which is where my breeder is and driving the puppy back. And that's like all of that together is going to take like a week. Um, and then when I get home, it's going to be only one week till I would have to leave for ReaperCon, and the puppy's only going to be like nine and a half weeks old or something. So because of the puppy and I knew this was going to happen. I, I, I was preparing people for it well in advance because I knew it might. And then once the puppies were born, the date was set. Uh, cause you, we pick them up at eight weeks. So yeah, I will not be here. This is the first ReaperCon I'm going to miss ever in all the history of ReaperCon because I was one of the people who helped make ReaperCon. So this is, this is it. The puppy has, uh, has caused me to miss the ReaperCon, but that's all right. We still love her. Um, yeah, the only thing at this point that could possibly interfere is if somehow all of the puppies, like, just have a major, like, issue. Which isn't, like, isn't not likely. So yeah, so probably baby puppy means I stay home and David is, David's still going, my fiance. Uh, he's still teaching. Because we had the hotel room and like there's no reason for him to stay home too. He looks forward to ReaperCon every year. All right, so let's get that little, this, this started. So with a big fold, you might find that you have to do a layer up top and then you have to go down and layer it a little bit further further down into the fold, especially with a shallow fold. Um, hobbies, if you are, if you're on my Patreon, you then on my discord, I will often, um, give feedback to people. I don't like guarantee it, but like usually if people post in show off and, and, uh, tag me or sh if, if it's a show off, if it's like, in progress than post in in progress, but I do try to get to those. Um, I, I am on my discord just a couple times a week, so it won't be an instant response, but just cause I'm usually working on my next, uh, actual content. 
but yeah, I do give, I do give feedback, not like huge in-depth feedback usually. Um, cause that is more of a, like a coaching type of thing. But if you have a specific question, like, is this blue working or what can I do to make this green better? You know, stuff like that. Or, you know, is the skin tone like good enough or how do I do X, you know? Yeah, great eco. Well, cats, cats exist to get over barriers, right? It's one of their hobbies. Um, I, I have a couple of coaching levels, uh, but I'm, I'm actually phasing them out, um, hobbies. Because I find that uh, I would rather be doing like PDFs and videos for everyone. Like I'm just realizing it's kind of something you do when you make this your job. You kind of like do a bunch of stuff and then you figure out what you enjoy the most and what you feel like people are getting the most out of. What I've come into with coaching is like, except for a couple of people who are very prolific painters, it often comes to feel like homework for people. Um, it's a lot, if you don't paint frequently, it's a lot of pressure to actually have something for me every month. And then like the deadlines wobble back and forth a lot. And that, that stresses me out cause I like to plan my whole month. Um, so yeah, it's just not, it's not something I really like. I like, I enjoy giving feedback in person. I enjoy giving, if you can catch me at a con, like I will always be happily give you feedback. Um, but I would, I've learned that I really enjoy doing like videos for like YouTube and my Patreon. And I, that's, that's the part that I really like. I love doing PDFs, you know, stuff like that. So I'm gravitating more toward that and I'm slowly cutting tears off of my coaching, cutting slots. If I can figure out a way to do it, like in a way that um, feels good to me, then I'll consider putting them back on. But right now, right now I'm not sure what that might look like. So I'm always open, but. Oh, you got in Davis Light class. Good, 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 good. And you're teaching. Ooh, Carrie. Ooh. Wow, big steps. Yeah, I mean, I like to be, I won't do, um, be doing virtual for ReaperCon. I think I'm going to be puppy wrangling, uh, Carrie, but, um, sorry, I'm catching up on all these. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I am a planner, big time. So, I don't know, it's just, I, I enjoy doing, um, like I, I have done in-person seminars locally, like for groups of like eight to 10 people. And I like that a little bit more. I feel like I'm reaching more people, but it can also be stressful because I am an introvert. So it's like, just a hard call really. I'm just seeking, really I'm seeking my best possible and career <laughs> at this point. Uh now, people who do do coaching, two guys who I know who are really good at it are Matt Pietro and Aaron Lovejoy. They both do um, coaching through Miniature Monthly. Like that's their, their kind of their thing that they do is their, their Patreon and is Miniature Monthly. But, um, and they're, they're both great coaches. Like I, I feel like sometimes I don't know if I'm a great coach. Like it's why I ask a lot of questions about people's process and how they learn well and stuff like that. Um, there we go. I feel like I could be a better coach. Yeah, ReaperCon is great. Great. Yeah, ReaperCon, every year we refine it a little bit more, right? I am sad to be missing it. Like, I'm super excited for the new puppy. Don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't even think about the online classes. I just, um, like, the potential for online classes. I just told Ron I wasn't going to wasn't gonna be able to be there. You guys get Derek Schubert for your award ceremony, though, I think. So you, you should be in, in good hands because uh, Derek will be very good at it. You may just want him to keep doing it. <laughs> so no more, no and for the award ceremony this year. That's going to be the big one, right? 
You've been staring, watching me do the award ceremony for years and years and years. All right, so let's build a highlight. I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to just try to build a highlight for this color and see how it's coming together, see if I still like it. Um, if you did virtual classes, and if you've done, you've done classes before, Kiri, I think you should be fine. I am going to build a highlight for this that involves using both Runic Glow and Amethyst Purple. I want this guy to be pretty jewel-toned, so I don't want to use a skin color to uh, build my purple highlight. Yeah, yeah, I know. And so two big brushfuls of my purple is what I'm starting with. So whenever I build a highlight, I always start with two big brushfuls with my mixing brush of my previous color. Yep, yep, yeah, Aaron's good. Aaron also does coaching one-on-one. -on -one. And hopefully he's a lot less awkward. <laughs> Aaron. Love Joy. He's something else. But he's a great painter. And he's a very good teacher. So depends also one thing to live. I don't know what level you're at, hobbies. Like as far as level of coaching, level of painting. I do feel, I will be straight up with you guys. I do feel that if you are a beginning painter, where you're still like like trying to master your intermediate techniques, I feel like you um, you probably, like coaching might not be worth the money for you. The people I have found who get the most out of one-on-one -on -one coaching with a, with a really good painter are people who are at the intermediate stage and they're refining and trying to troubleshoot. Or they're trying to learn a new technique, a brand new technique they've never tried before, a more advanced technique, like maybe textures or... Maybe, um, you know, like doing realistic lighting or, you know, just mastering color, you know, things like that. I think there's a lot of resources out there for, for people who are starting out in the hobby that'll get you to that point, especially with all the awesome YouTube and Patreons there are now. Um, I think once you get to that point, that's when I think it, it makes sense for you to maybe invest in a in a one-on-one -on -one coaching with a really good painter if you really want to pop up your level or if, or if there's something that's just frustrating you repeatedly and you're having a real trouble grokking it then sometimes one-on-one -on -one coaching can be good so i added one drop of runic purple or sorry runic glow not runic purple sorry the the magenta e color glowy color this one and one drop of the amethyst purple to my midtone my wild violet um this may not be enough now if i want to keep the color pretty bright I am going to go to pure white for my highlight. I'm not going to use an off-white of any sort. I'm going to do half a, half a drop of white, though. So, like, just squeeze a little bit out, pop it against the side of my palette, like so. That's not going to give me as much impact. It's going to lighten the color a bit, though. Because I'm going to thin this... So it needs to be, remember, in order for it for me to thin it and make it a good transition, I, it needs to kind of be different, significantly different. Just like these guys are significantly different, this is now significantly different. Now, because I did add pure white, though, I'm going to have to add water. I'm going to add two drops right off the bat. Then I'm going to see how it goes, and I might need to add more. Mix it up with my mixing brush. Oh, good, yeah. Real life friends, awesome. Um, you can either just use your plastic, you know, normal black base, um, or you can use a plinth. Uh, if you are putting, if you're leaving the mini on a black base, do do some basing, like even if it's cursory. Unless it's obvious that your mini is just meant to be displayed like itself on a flat black base. Um, in painters, we don't uh, necessarily like good basing. Extra basing isn't going to hurt you in painters, but having some basing is going to like, if you don't have anything, it's going to drop you like 5%. I think it's 5 to 10%. Um, so just cursory basing, if nothing else. Um, or you can do a plinth. If you do a plinth, especially with like a bust, 
Um, then it makes sense not to do any basing. Uh, a plinth, you can sometimes just get away with the, the mass, the figure on its own base. You're just putting it on a plinth like this guy. If I took the sticky tack out and painted the plinth nicely. Um, however, that said, most of the time when I've done plinths, I don't have any examples right here. Um, mostly I save plinths for uh, bus and I'll do the figure just on its own base unless I'm doing something where I'm building up the base. Like if we're doing something like we did for the orc or for bunny here, like this would be okay for competition. I did some basic basing. Bunny's integral base is disguised. It's part of the base. I chopped it up with the side cutters so that it looked more like rocks. Um, so this is perfectly good. I mean, lots of people enter their minis just on their regular gaming bases. So you do either. It's your choice, Miss Nimp. Unless there's a bust and then it generally needs something. Um... For some busts, like, like sometimes I've done a big block and sometimes I've done a smaller wooden base, but I always have something to kind of widen the foot because even if your bust has an integral base, like, like Noli here, like Noli's got an integral base and you would think that that would be wide enough, but in reality, she's still pretty wobbly on this. So I would definitely like kind of sand down the bottom of this base if I was going to actually finish her for a competition or for display. I would sand down the bottom of the base um, and then I would put it onto a wooden base or I would just pull this out entirely because it's, it's actually a separate piece that, that's been glued in or stuck in. Um, I might actually clip this off entirely or take it off and just glue this part and drill it down into a wooden base depending on what appearance you're going for. No, that makes sense, Miss Tim. Yeah, and that will that'll make sure that people are viewing it from that angle if if it's important to the story especially. Ah, color theory is not that hard well says the person who spent 20 years teaching it there are some key things with color theory i mean one of the things is the thing i talked about at the start of this stream where you want to alternate dark and light colors on the miniature it's color composition essentially by making sure that my scrolls here are mostly surrounded by a darker purple i make the scrolls stand out by alternating orange and purple i make a pleasing pattern around the figure um the other thing to to just start with is just the triads the red yellow blue triad and the orange green purple triad you can always use any two or all three of those together and they'll look fine so if you only started with those things hobbies bash like the fact that alternating colors so between light and dark or light medium and dark on your figure is is always a good plan and um keeping the triads in mind you would, you would, right there, you'd have the foundation of miniatures color theory. It gets a lot more complicated when you start talking about, like, muted versus um, bright colors and stuff like that. Uh, and, like, shifting colors and, like, colors that are maybe not as clear cut as this orange and this purple. But in general, if you start with that foundation, it's good. Like, the one, one thing I do run into is people who are painting every like they'll they'll pick out colors and they'll pick a medium red a medium blue and a medium brown and it'll all be the same it won't be there won't be a light color a dark color a middle color they'll all be the same and that just kind of makes the whole model kind of like it doesn't really stand out it doesn't guide the eye around it very well um it would be better if they had a dark color, a light color, and a medium color. Or if they at least had a dark and a medium color and they alternated those. Contrast is king. Alrighty, I'm actually going to... I want a darker shadow for this, so I'm going to build it. I'm going to build it just like we talked about at the start of the stream. I'm going to add a little bit of walnut brown to my imperial purple. I decided I wanted a slightly darker shadow in these folds here. I don't want a line 
the folds, but I want a slightly darker shadow and I want a shadow that I can paint in underneath edges. So I'm gonna start with four drops of the purple. And I am gonna put one entire drop of walnut in here because this is a dark color and I think it'll be okay. I could be wrong. That's because we all love colors. Well, and some people, that's where hobbies, that's where um, you're going to come in to conflicting viewpoints from different painters. Some painters like Sergio will, uh, they're very much ascribed to having a warm color, like an overall warm or overall cool color scheme. But not all of us do that. Not all of us really agree with that, that that's like you, what we don't always agree that's best practice. Um, and so it's a philosophy, like do be aware that a lot of color theory after you're done with like the basic setup, a lot of it is personal preference. Like many painters will prefer to paint with a certain kind of system in place. It helps them. It gives their work a very unique look. All right. So to show you how walnut has overwhelmed our purple, that's where we are right now. Let's put a black base next to it so you can really see it. So as you can see, I do have a really dark purple here, but you can see how the walnut has made it more brown and it's made it a lot more dark. So walnut is a very, very strong color. But yeah, you can get as nitpicky and as nuancey with color theory as you want, or you can be as big as big and bold with it as you want, and neither approach is wrong, and that's the best thing about color theory. Um, and even with all the rules that I give in my Patreon for my color PDFs, it's uh, they're always you can always break the rules. You can always break the rules as long as you know what you're doing. Yeah, it is good. That's four to one walnut, four to one um, imperial to walnut. Hey, Roger. But yeah, that's one of the best things about getting instruction from different painters, right? Is that everybody describes things differently too. Sometimes two painters, you know, they'll describe something totally different, but it'll be the same kind of thing. And, uh, but one way will kind of make it, make you go, oh, aha, you know, and the other way will be kind of confusing. And that's just, you know, different teaching styles, different ways of descri describing the same thing. That's why it's always worth taking more classes. I mean, I still take classes and workshops. And for me now, it's mostly to get somebody else's take on a topic. Like I'll, I'll be bored with the way I'm painting and I'll want to switch it up. All right. So I went in and I made those folds a little darker with that shadow color. And I also want to kind of make it a little darker up here underneath this edge. Um, I also want to make it a little darker way down here on the way underside of the sleeve. Which will make essentially a very dark shadow against these scrolls, which is going to make them stand out more. Also, right under those scrolls, I really need a shadow. I don't have anything there, so I'm going to grab my nice shadow here. This shadow is pretty close to um, Regal Purple, the shadow of the Monarch Purple Triad. It's maybe a little bit more muted because there's a lot of black in it. Regal has a little bit of purple or a little bit of black in it, but not a lot. So um, essentially, you can see the wet paint. I'm painting a shadow underneath these edges. And because I thinned my paint a bit, I'm going to build it up in a couple of layers. So I can put that darker shadow in there. And I can also kind of make a little bit of dashes down the middle of some of these uh, folds if I want the shadow to go a little bit darker. Um, okay, which color are you talking about, Roger? We've used two shadows. This is Imperial Purple. This is four to one Imperial to Walnut. My base color became one of my shadow colors, essentially. As always, by going back and watching the VOD, you can get some of the context behind that. There's always context. 
there's always like things that we talk about like how walnut can be a good shading color and why you have to be careful with it so gonna continue I thinned it maybe a little bit much so I'm having to layer it over these colors a little bit A little bit darker there we go now i'm getting some nice dark shadows in here and i like that it's giving you that purple a lot of depth right you can see that that transition is more interesting now we're getting deeper color more dramatic lighting which is great for this guy because in a lot of ways this guy's pretty simple right he's mostly cloth and scrolls and so if we can really punch the shadows and the highlights on this purples and these oranges we suddenly make it look much richer and more interesting. Yes, and again, if you're on my Patreon, I just did a $5 PDF on this. I was talking yesterday on my Patreon Discord about how, like, some people, like, jump into a Patreon and they think they have to read or watch everything, and that's the point of Patreon, but that's not really... I, I'm kind of, like feeling like that it's not the point of mine. Like I try very hard to use a lot of keywords and my goal with my Patreon is that no matter what project you're working on, you should be able to like use keywords to navigate to the lesson you need for that project. So really, if you do sign up for my Patreon, don't think you have to jump in and, and like listen and watch everything. It's actually a far more effective tool if you look at the project you're working on and say, okay, I need something on blonde hair, do a search specifically on blonde hair, and you're like, oh, there are two lessons on blonde hair, and then you can watch those or read those or whatever, right? So I feel like um, I feel I'm trying to make my Patreon into more of a tactical resource where you always can reach for it and you always can find an answer. And if at any point you cannot find an answer and you're a patron, tell me. Message me, email me, whatever. Um, Tell me, hey, I was looking for something on X and I don't see anything. Because then that's great, because then I can make a lesson. Sometimes um, I'll even do a lesson on it on this stream, but that's not as effective because I have a lot of patrons who don't watch the stream. So I have a lot of patrons who are on the stream every day, but also ones that aren't. So I tend to default to putting it on the Patreon Although I'll sometimes also talk about it on stream, like with the walnut thing that I just talked about. All right, let's try to get a little bit of this highlight in here and see what we got. Yeah, cool hobbies. I'm glad that you that you utilize it that way and that you find value with it that way. That's really my goal. Like that is really I kind of want it to be my online. Like I always uh I always like told people, people always have for 20 years people have told me I need to write a painting book. The Patreon is kind of my live painting book. The Patreon and the YouTube together for sure because the YouTube even has some like beginner basic stuff. But it's like if I had an online, like, interactive painting book, like the Patreon plus the dis plus the YouTube or plus the Discord, you know, like I want it to be like a book where you can just say, "I need to know X," and I can go and look up that chapter, which in this case would be a video or a PDF. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Because then I can easily update material too. Like if I feel like, like right now I feel like some of my NMM Gold videos have gotten old and I didn't like, I can think of a better way to do them. And so I can redo that, do an updated video and put in the notes, you know, hey, this is an update for my previous videos. There we go. So I'm just kind of tentatively taking in some of the highlight. You can see that highlight going right down the middle and you can see it because it's leaving brush marks. And that means that I need to thin it more if I want a smooth blend. However, I can also just leave that a little bit bolder like it is and take my previous color, the Wild Violet, and either glaze it over the top of this or uh, kind of just the feather it in on the edges.
a little bit too much paint on there. So I'm going to grab my brush and rinse it off and kind of take that down. And that'll, f you can see how it fuzzed it in on the one side that I did it right. So now it's more blended. And this is like getting smooth blending with layering is uh, time consuming, but it does give you the best control. So there are times when I reach more for wet blending on a big surface, but if I want um, controlled highlighting on a small surface, I will often reach for layering because, uh, because it allows me to be precise. So it's time consuming, but its advantage is it's far, it, it enables you to be far more precise and tight with your uh, detailing than wet blending. Yeah, it's very good for cloth for sure. And it's got some nice drop places to put drop shadows. I'm just painting more of the Bones USA stuff now because I really like the level of detail. But pretty soon we're going to be shifting over and doing some monsters. So got some Jason Weeby elementals lined up that we'll be starting. I would imagine... Um, Probably starting in August. It won't take us that many more cycles to finish the Centaur. So bringing that highlight up. Most of the light you're seeing up here is actually just from my overhead light. So let's put some actual highlights up here. Now for really tight areas, I am going to go vertical. Even though this is a long fold, I'm going to violate my crossways rule because there's not a lot of room here to do crossways. Um, highlighting. Now when the sleeve gets a little wider, then maybe I do the cross cross highlight. And it's a little wider here, so maybe I do it a little bit here. But yeah, another thing about the coaching, um, uh, hobbies Vesh is I really do feel like um, it's good if you go into it with a specific goal like when I when I took my Sergio class I had a very specific goal in mind when I took my Kirill class I had a very specific goal in mind with Kirill I wanted to learn textures and so I paid very close attention and came out with that with that goal and then with Sergio I wanted to kind of get a handle on his lighting and his process. And his process turned out not to be like, like kind of for me, but the lighting um, understanding I carried away from that class was worth it. I'm not Moonlight. And the reason I'm not is that I want this to be really saturated. Like I want him to be really in jewel tones. Um, and so I'm probably even going to glaze with some magenta uh, over the top of this to really pop it up a bit. But yeah, I talked about it. I talked about using skin tones, but I find that if I want to use skin tones, I want to use it on a softer purple where I don't want it as, uh, as vibrant. Nope. No, this is a mixture of um, ah, all the colors that, that I'm using. We're using wild violet. So it's a couple of brushfuls of the wild violet plus the amethyst purple and the runic glow. One to one. So very, very straight up uh, purple highlight. But yeah, I have, uh, usually I agree, I grab a skin tone. If I'm going to do uh, peach, it's going to be um, Peachy Flesh. 9445, I think. Or is it six? No, it's five. 9445, Peachy Flesh. Which I currently have in the other room because I was working with it, I think. But it's a very, very orangey skin tone. And it is a good highlighter for purples. But yeah, I wanted... Uh, Wanted it to stay a little more saturated purple, so I'll show you guys the glaze in a second. Actually, I think I might use, um, rather than straight magenta, I might use runic glow. Although using runic glow actually has a downside, and that's that's going to raise the, um, the, sh the uh, shade. Like, it's going to make all the dark lighter. So maybe not. Maybe it is clear magenta time. So let's do that. So this is really what, I, what I'm making these two areas now is kind of a proof of concept, right? I'm 
I'm trying to figure out how I want to do my purples. And so I've chosen these two folds and I'm kind of executing everything on them before I do the rest of the model in order to see if this is the way I really want to go. That way, if you don't like it, you know it's really easy to reset it just by painting your imperial purple over the top. But yeah, there are definitely purple, uh, there are purples I've highlighted with peach, but not recently. Because I haven't done a really muted purple for a while. I've been doing more bright colors. Because I was, I was on a muted kick and then I was like, hey, I haven't painted bright for a while. And now I'm like, everything is bright. <laughs> But the purple that I'm going to be working with for my um, my limbo model that I'm working with on uh, my stream on Saturdays, that that purple is is um, a more brown purple, and it will definitely be highlighted with um, an orangey peach color. All right, so let's make a glaze. Bloop. We're going to use uh, clear bright magenta. I haven't done this one for a while either. Boop. Just need a little bit. And I'm going to right away drop two drops of water into that. So it's a one to two. Then we're going to assess it. Clear magenta is very highly pigmented, but it's also a pretty translucent pigment. Yeah, that's way too strong. So when you look at this and you look at how much it colors the side here, that's really punchy. We don't want it to be that punchy. I'm going to drop another drop in it, go to one to three. Kind of sit and wait. This is why I, there are two reasons to mix your glazes in a palette. One is to see the level of glaze that you're going to end up with. And two is because if you thin any paint this much in a wet, wet palette, it's just going to slurp the water right through the palette. And it's also going to maybe spider web, depending. You really, if you're going to glaze on your wet palette, you've got to do it brush, brushful by brushful rather than mixing up a big batch. So this is about perfect. We're getting a shift, but it's not a huge shift. See how light this went? That's perfect. So I can grab a little bit of that and I can essentially paint it from one side to the other all the way across. And then I'm gonna quick rinse out my brush, kind of dry it off, squeeze the water out with my hand, and then I'm gonna pull off any excess fluid, although I, I'd used a pretty, pretty thin layer, but I did get the whole thing, you can see that. Now we're gonna let it dry and see how much it colored and influenced that area. We'll get a little closer once it has dried. So you can see it's gonna dry very light, but I can already see the difference. We'll get closer. You can you can kind of see it though. You can see that this is um, reading as a richer purple and this is more washed out. You do wanna wait for it to fully dry though. It's going to dry lighter than it looked when wet, and that's why you wait. And that's also why you make it a really, really thin glaze where it's not super strong. Because you can always put another layer on, you cannot take a layer off. So, let's see. Yeah, so when I make sure to turn it away, you can see that it's gotten more purpley down here. It's a little more red. It's not that, that washed out color anymore. Um, and it seems a little richer, a little redder. See the difference between the more reddish tone here and the more bluish tone here? And that's because we've done that magenta. It's essentially the same result as mixing a little magenta into every color that we previously used. Now, if you don't want that shift and you want it to stay more blue, um, which admittedly does work really well with the orange here, um, then I would use clear purple as your glaze. But I tend to like a warmer highlight, and so that's why I grabbed the magenta. So this is still a pretty nice purple. It did take down the highlight a little bit, um, so we'd have to re-highlight. But at this point, I might actually take some of the highlight color and add a little bit of this magenta straight to it. Because if I've decided that I want um, a more vibrant, warmer highlight, then I should probably mix it. So we'll see how that works. 
And you can see what, if you leave the color pooling, you can see what it starts to do. You can see that coffee ring that we're getting around the outside here where the paint pulls up and it dries on the raised surfaces with little rings. That's why you never let a glaze sit. It is not a wash. It is much thinner than a wash, much less body than a wash. You really are just putting a, a very small, slight filter over an area, a filter of color. I'm gonna just paint this highlight a little bit over the top here. Let's see if I like that a little bit better. Got, got a lot of glare. Moved my light slightly, so. Gonna glaze a little bit of that magenta. If you use only a little bit of the glaze on your brush, you really can just put one quick layer over everything. Just make sure you're hitting everything. You don't wanna leave any lines, any um, spots that aren't covered, or you will get that coffee stain effect. So this is more like what I would call a spot glaze. For big, big areas, like if I was glazing all of this, I would be putting a lot of paint on here and then I would just be wicking off all the excess to leave a very thin skin of paint. Because when you're doing a big area like this, it's all too easy to get let it get away from you and paint it, paint it part and then, oh my gosh, this edge dried while I was filling in this part because it tends to dry fast uh, when it's that thin. So for this, either use a much bigger brush and go fast or add a lot more glaze and spread it out over the whole surface and then wash your brush off, dry it off a little bit or squeeze the water out and then come back and wick off all the excess water. All right, so I think I like this purple um, with the glaze. So I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna rock this. So we'll get our palette back and we'll uh, you can see the differences. This one has one level of highlight. This has the darker shadow and the higher highlight. More dramatic light sourcing is essentially what that is giving us a, a visual cue there. Now here this is hard because there's this big overshadowing scroll. And so you're gonna see a bit of shadow and only down here probably at the bottoms are you gonna start to see the highlight. So I'm gonna grab my shadow color which remember is the four drops of imperial purple, one drop of walnut. And I'm adding a little bit of water to it because it's been sitting for a while, so it's evaporated just a tad. Yeah, we just don't know what yet, b I haven't decided. With models that I paint myself, like for me, I always have a concept for that. With stuff that I'm doing on stream here, I often just don't because I'm just painting the mini. I don't have a real emotional investment in it. So I just let it come to me. Like, depending on what I feel like teaching, it will be what I decide to do. Although it'd be kind of fun to do something funny like fry egg, with a little picture of an egg and a fire, fire symbol. Although I kind of liked the idea of the flying carpet spell with the picture of the carpet. That could be fun. So little, little tiny kind of dashes going down into this uh, fold. I don't want the fold to be super dark. It's pretty shallow, but um, we do have that heavy shadow coming down from the scroll. So I do want to make sure that it's darker at the top.
I, I really, I, I don't think I'm feeling that one, Viva Aqua. I'm, I'm typically not taking like um, freehand suggestions on these things because most people want something silly and usually I don't feel like doing silly. That would be a good idea if, like, you had the easel from the, um, whatever the Reapercon Sophie was that, the artist Sophie year, and you had him essentially, like, put the easel up and make the paintbrush hover with the tip right on the canvas, and the canvas is blank, and then you have him unrolling this Bob Ross painting, and it's starting to paint that. That would be a great, that would be a great thing, but it doesn't make, it, it would make sense then, right? Like, I like my models to make sense. It's one of my personal faults. <laughs> but yeah, I tend not to go with the silly. I go with silly a great many places in my life, but... No, Julie, no! I'm sorry, is it is it still alive? I mean, the only good thing is that you're like a super top-notch sculptor, and so you can fix it, but at the same time, oh no. Is it your ReaperCon entry? Yeah, everybody's giving you horrified faces. Tell us if it's still alive. You can't keep us in suspense. Unless, of course, you're mourning its death, then you can have a moment. All right, because now we're in a dark frame of mind. Active cat, there could be an active cat, yeah. That's true. Oh, yes, for Reapercon. Oh, no. It damaged all the points. Oh, no. We're very sad. We wish your diorama a quick and efficient recovery and not too much of a pain in the butt. That's very sad. That like takes the wind out of my sails when that happens. My sails get very flat. I have to put it aside for a couple days before I get like that that burst of no, I will not let this beat me, and then I then I'll dive back in. <laughs> but usually I need at least one day of mourning when I uh, inadvertently uh, damage something because I am clumsy or in a hurry a lot and that means uh yeah I feel it I'm sorry Julie putting in darker shadows guys behind here you can see that dark shadow now you can do it you can do it just tell Ron, like, that, like, um, it was one of his minis and, uh, it'll delay the, the, the completion. Ah, oh, you were rushing. Yeah, that's what happens to me. I rush and then stupid things happen and I'm like, no! Like that. All right, so now we've got a nice, you guys can see that nice dark shadow coming up under here. I'm going to darken the shadow right here again because of the scrolls uh, really casting a dark shadow down there. You can see it falling over there as I move the model to where it's uh, where the light falls. You can see really the light only touches like down here really. So we're going to throw a little bit more shadow up here to darken down that area. So we can have our dramatic shadows. Well, I, I have faith in you, Julie. I think you can do it. Don't stretch yourself out, though. You have you have lots of days left till ReaperCon.
I think I think the example of what not to do is just try not to rush around your miniatures, Twisted Oma. And no matter how many times I tell myself that, I, I still end up doing it and then kicking myself. I'm always like, it'll be fine. Or I'm not thinking. I suppose you could use it to train yourself to be slower and more deliberate around minis, but... All right, so just layering in the shadow, just like I did the highlight, I'm just using a dark color and concentrating it on the shadow areas, and I'm testing it by putting it underneath my light source to see if it's uh, covering the appropriate area, and it is. I'm going to bring this down just a little bit more. I feel like that's pretty good, pretty good dark shadow there. Lots of examples of what not to do, yeah. Right when you've um, when you've been painting or sculpting for as long as we have, <laughs> you get lots of examples. <laughs> we are never at a loss for examples. Oh, sad. <laughs> it's a thing. Uh, I think that might take too long. Oh well. Thanks for trying to help Twisted Oma. Sometimes though, you just gotta take a step back and just like shove it out of sight for a day or two. I pretty much like, uh, I, I'm like, the universe has beaten me and I push it, put it, put it away. And then, you know, two days later, I'll be like, the universe will not beat me. And then I will go back at it. But I always, I always take a moment. I, I need at least a day to recover from stuff like that. To get my oomph back. Challenge the universe. Anyway, let's give Julie time to figure out what she's going to do. And uh, I'm putting up my warmer highlight down here at the bottom at the foot of the cloak. You can see kind of a demarcation line right there on the screen. I'm going to see if I can focus just a little bit more there. There, now you can see a little clearer. <laughs> he isn't allowed to touch it till after we've gone. Yeah, I agree. Don't you touch it. Because we all know what happens to things in D&D &D games. They get freaking dice rolled at them by people who don't respect all the time and effort that you put into your miniatures. Like, it's like I'm convinced that every mini that goes on a D&D &D table needs to be given a little additional, like, shield stuck to it somewhere to try to deflect rolled dice. All right, so getting some highlights in here. I'm gonna throw a glaze on it after I've got my last highlight on. Now, there is a point beyond which you don't want to take up your highlights. Um, and essentially, this is like, you should, to ask yourself this question, you actually have to ask yourself what may at first be a question that blows your mind if you haven't ever thought about it before, which is, what kind of fabric is this? And you'll be like, well, I don't need to know that. This is a 28 millimeter figure. But you do actually need to know that. Um, because even the simplest question, the simplest version of that question is, is this a shiny fabric or a dull fabric? So you don't necessarily need to know that this is an 86% cotton blend, but you do need to know, is it shiny or is it dull? Or is it somewhere in between? Because all cloth will have, you know, one of those properties. Some cloth is very dull. Some cloth is, is quite shiny, depending on the uh, type of fiber used to make it. And so... For you, why does this matter for you? It matters for you because the shinier the cloth, the higher the highlights will go. Oh, yeah, Kroniko. Mm. 
Yeah. Yep, so many, yeah, when they're used to using the cheapo plastic pre-painted ones, like crazy barbarians toss minis like that, that, Karina, is, uh, is the answer. Crazy people toss minis. And sometimes we have crazy people at our gaming tables and we don't realize it until it's too late. Then we have to dock them thousands of experience points and make them listen to me, listen to uh, us harangue them for all the damage they did to the thing it took us hours to paint. Then they would have to paint a Bob Ross painting, and this is the wrong shape of canvas. So yeah, so essentially I can bring up the folds on this to a certain point, but beyond that, if I do anything beyond that, if I get close to white at all, it's going to start looking shiny. And I don't necessarily want that. This is not really what I wanted for him. I do want his, his robes to have a little bit of a sheen, obviously. I want some drama. Um, but I don't want a lot. So I think that that's about where I want those highlights to end up. Yeah, at that point, you got to start giving a speech before you start running your game, which is, hey guys, I spent hours painting these miniatures. If you pick them up with greasy fingers or you throw them across the table or you roll a dice into them, you're no longer invited to my game. Good. We, we, we clear? Okay, let's game. <laughs> And I'm going to glaze with that clear magenta to bring up that level. You can really see the red now when it's wet. It'll be less evident when it dries. The grocery list of things to finish, Roger. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a, it's a, it's a list idea that many people have used called a punch list, really. Um, where when you get to the end of a project, you, uh, you make your, your short list of things that are yet to do so you don't forget anything. That's, you have a good group then, Anara. That's good. Yep, and it's always the people... Well, of course it's the people who never paint because they don't understand how much time goes into it. Time and love. All right, so backing up. As we look at the model, we can really clearly see the folds. They're nice and uh, we've got a lot of nice drama going on. It's a very rich purple color, which is what I wanted. I wanted it to be a very rich, like he's a he's a rich merchant mage and, and uh, that, that kind of thing. That's kind of why I was thinking about the flying carpet idea, whoever suggested that. I kind of like the whole, uh, because he would have, uh, he would have an inventory. <laughs> you know, that used to be true. But it's not as true these days, I think, in Ara, right? Because, you know, these days a lot of people are into D&D because D&D is kind of in. Like, there are cool kids who play D&D. So, you know, then it's it's no longer that you're the outcast who never had any social skills. It's, you know, there's a lot of people. So I don't give people an, an automatic buy on that anymore. Um, I mean, you still had, do have that stereotypical um, gamer kid who really just doesn't have social skills. But... I find that a lot of gamers nowadays are, are um, more with it than that, which is good. You know, we needed to get away from that stereotype eventually. So... I do want to put a bit of a shadow around the little uh, rim here on the top of the hat. It's probably going to be gold. Yeah, I really do uh, imagine this guy as a merchant mage, like the dude in um, the dude in the Critical Role cartoon. What's his name? Zimporium. The magic item shop. Like I totally see this guy as that that guy this is that sort of mage. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, accidents happen for sure. There are always those accidents, and usually that person is mortified and, like, absolutely, like, shocked, shocked and dismayed and sorry, sorry, sorry. 
But those are the good people. And although we might be like, erg, watch yourself, we, we still understand it. It's the people who are just thoughtless that I that I get more frustrated with. Yeah, so we got it really, I like this purple. This is a really nice, rich purple. I like it. He paid a lot for this robe, darn it. Isn't painting purple awesome? I just love painting purple. I could paint purple all the time. Yeah. Well, and then there's the players that just like they get you. Like I had a I had a player once who uh, he loved my games, and the reason that he loved my games is that he got it. Like he got my vibe, right? He he loved the heroism, and he loved like some of the tropes that I really liked. Like they were he was he was like he got it. He got me. He got the game, but that made it really hard to trick. Because once they know you and they know your tropes and they know the kind of game you like to run, they can predict you. Much harder to throw the curveball at that point. All right, so I'm going to use, again, instead of going across the fold, there's two little folds up here. You can see it there on your can on the cam. I'm going to go straight over them with the highlight because they're just too narrow. So trying to go across those folds wouldn't be very effective. So I'm going to do just a quick, quick stroke with my first highlight. And I stop that, like, I start that stroke right here because this is where the, the cloth really folds back around the scroll. So you would definitely have the shadow start there. And I'm going to come at it from the other way. And here we see just a little bit of that first fold and more of the, the second fold here becomes more like the whole sleeve. So I'm actually going to grab, because it's hard to see this on this little surface, and that happens too if your highlights and your shadows are well blended, um, it can be hard to see. So I'm going to take actually my more bold highlight to bring up these features. Because I can always glaze over it. So I can always bring it back down. Nothing is forever in mini painting. Unless you've torched your mini and melted it. Then, you know, if you actually used a blowtorch, then, you know, you're, yeah, you've kind of done the irrevocable there. But up to that point. You can always walk it back. All right, so we'll let that dry and then kind of look at where we are. And the sleeve kind of like comes out. So again, I'm using a vertical stroke. So with a hanging sleeve like this, where the light is coming down, the sleeve is out, I will sometimes use this sort of stroke instead of going across like this, just because of the way the light is falling down this uh, very vertical surface. And I need shade as well. We're moving our way around to the back side of the mini. Got a lot of cloth to do, but it's 11, so we only have five minutes. So I'm gonna gra grab my shadow, and I do need to grab a card. Ah, this actually is for a different mini. I forgot to put my card away for Madame Delia. All right, where's my next card? Well, I'm gonna need a card. I just ordered a new package of uh, artist trading cards so that I would have enough. So I will have to do kind of a, a card for this to remember the shadows and everything. Because I like this progression that I've got going on. So we'll do that real quick at the end. So first we'll get the shadow. Shadow up here. So dark shadow right there. Putting in a real dark shadow 
here is a good way to get the edge of this cloak to show up. So if you must cross over a purple thing over a purple thing, like I did here, because I had already alternated everywhere else I could, then put a dark shadow where the one crosses over the other. And that will enable you to highlight this overlapping edge and keep these areas separate visually so that they'll both show up. So just to put a real quick highlight on it. I can just pick up that highlight, make that show up a little bit better. All right, so just like I've got, I do this regularly. Y'all have seen me do it. Like doing um, from our Madame Delia, that's her, her notes. They sit right under her where she is up here on my shelf so that I always have them. And I use, sometimes I'll often use both, both sides of the card, but I don't think I've got a card for this guy yet. I think he's just himself. So in this case, we're gonna do our shadow color, do a swatch. Some people uh, do it uh, on an app. Some people will do this on their, on their phones. They'll take a picture of the palette and they'll make notes. Um, but I like to have it on a card. That way I can directly swatch next to this color when I come back to it and I can see if I'm matching. So I'm gonna four to one. 90, 23, 91, 36, shadow. Then we'll just do a quick. We're gonna do 123. And then we're grab our highlight. So I'm just doing little micro swatches for these because these two colors are out of the bottle. So 9023 Wild Violet plus and then I'm going to go Wild Violet i.e. two little, little marks plus Runic Glow Amethyst two, one, one. So that I've got my things. And if I want that wild violet to just be a little bit stronger, I can grab it. But yeah, so this way I just keep this under the mini on the shelf. If I want to, I can add it to my binder. I've got a card binder. These are the size of like magic cards. So it's actually quite easy to just keep a binder of color schemes that I've used um, organized however I want. Um, so I bought binder pages and a new uh, three ring binder to keep that. But yeah, for while I'm actively working on a project, this will enable me to recreate since we have a lot of more of this purple to do. It'll let me recreate all of that very accurately. And when I do a mix where I really want to nail it again, that's when I do the big swatch. Um, and uh, that way when I remix this, I'll be able to put a little bit like right off the end of this, just to see how they compare. You can find like, sometimes you can find big packs of like a hundred for cheap. When I went to order this last time, there weren't any of those for Eco, but you could also just buy, like one thing that I've done is I've bought um, a big pack of Bristol cardstock and just cut up my own. That's probably the most, uh, cost-effective way to do it. Or if you've got an old watercolor uh, pad, you can just cut them up from that. Just measure them, you know, measure them and use a ruler so you get good cuts and uh, you can fit them into the card binder if you're going to do it. Yeah, sure. I mean, almost all of us have an old, like, like watercolor pad or, or thicker paper pad. You know, if we've done any art, we've got it sitting around. Okuro, also just uh, totally off topic. Um, I'm, I'm halfway done with my first ball, my first Aragurumi ball. I'm only screwing it up a little. <laughs> I 
I'm very proud. I've been we've been watching TV in the in the evenings because Overwatch League is on, and I've just been doing stitches. So maybe I will have the puppy, although I'm threatening to put an extra squeaker in it. And David is giving me the look. Because I can make it a squeaky ball then, right? For the puppy. But yeah, it's it's cool. I might do a, sm a smaller one after this. Because the puppies can be little. So yeah, right? I still have no idea how to crochet anything else, but I can do a half of a ball. <laughs> you voted in favor of the squeaker? <laughs> All right, guys, that's where we are today. We did a lot of talk about, we did some color theory talk. We talked about mixing colors for purples, talked about glazing, how to apply it, you know, what not to do, stuff like that. Um, talked a bit about um, just thoughts of what to do on, do on the scroll. Um, yeah, yeah. A lot of layering, layering and glazing though, this video. So if you came in late, uh, that would be something for you to look at. Yeah, we do have crafty. Oh, wait, wait, we need a puppy picture. I forgot to give because I didn't have, I didn't have a, a recent picture. But I'll show um, Pink Girl again because she's adorbs. Pop date. Pink Girl says I has a sleepy. Sleepy puppy, sleepy puppy. Yes, crafty creative. Ooh, sculpting and ZBrush today. That's really cool. <laughs> Let me see if I can find the picture where Bridget took the puppy outside yesterday. We've had a lot of, we've been talking a lot about the plan because she's going to have her puppy people come for a puppy party after the evaluation and everything. So, oh, there we go. There's my friend Bridget with Pink Girl outside her backyard, introducing the puppy to the outside world. So yes, adorable puppies. Those are one of those puppies is gonna be mine. That little girl might be mine. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. We have three choices because there are three girls in this litter. So we have a solid black girl, and we have that girl who's gonna end up being saddle marked, like a, more like a traditional German Shepherd. And then we've got a sable girl who looks like she's gonna be maybe a golden sable. So yeah, adorbs. I know puppy. So, all right, guys, thank you very much. And remember to go and tune in for Josh later today. I hope you all have a great day. Tomorrow, tomorrow is kitty. Kitty, tomorrow is kitty. Kitty getting perilously close. Perilously close to done. All right. Talk to you all later. Have a fantastic day and bye-bye.